So good morning all of you. May I have your attention please? Yeah, so may I have your attention please? Good morning. Welcome to B-Sides 2019. So we have Chris, he is a former UTSA student and I met uh, him at CSA event, so he's personally a really good. I, I know him and he has uh, one YouTube channel online so you can watch, uh, watch around uh, reverse engineering and different malware. Uh, tutorials on online. So today he's going to be presenting uh, the reverse engineering with Gaidra and I'm sure it's going to be great presentation. As moving forward I would like to introduce and my like the sponsors for the B-Sides event. So gold level sponsors are St. Mary University, USA, Trend Micro, Digital Defense, Sense. Silver level sponsors are National Security Agency, ExaBeam, Accenture Federal Services, Open Security, Titanium Level, CyberSec Jobs, Denim Group, LMO ISA, Landmark Solution. So thank you all for being here and a part of this presentation. So Chris will now continue. Thank you. I have to do it this yeah. It's not actually allowed. It's for the audio purpose. Okay. okay. Give me a moment here. I have some uh, stickers over here if people want them. I'll leave them right here. Uh, come swarm me at the end and I may have some more stickers. All right, so this is going to be my talk. It's an introduction to reverse engineering with Yidra. Um But first, a little bit about me. So I'm a UTS or UTSA alumni. I uh, used to give talks at CSA and that type of thing, so some people may have seen me before. Um, I'm a cyber software engineer uh, at Raytheon Codex. Uh, I think my business card actually says I'm a cyber SAN, but uh, we'll disregard that for now. I like to do like crypto, reverse engineering, and that type of stuff for like CTFs and things like that. And then I'm on a CTF team called NASA Rejects. So what is reverse engineering? Um, I think many people might see this in the form of like malware analysis or maybe the reverse engineering tool for like a class or something like that but like in its essence what exactly are you doing when you're reverse engineering and um, so for this talk we're going to focus on like binary reverse engineering although I do have a um, Android APK that I'm going to show you that Ghidra can interact with but uh, that's more just for show mostly going to be focusing on like binary and so on. So it's generally taking some type of compiled code, ASM and stuff like that, and bringing it up to a higher level. So uh, for the most part of Ghidra, you're going to see like assembly on another page, and then you're going to see like some type of C light syntax on the right hand side. Uh, so from a show of hands, uh, actually let's just do a general consensus. So who's used Ghidra here before? All right, tough crowd, tough crowd. Um, how many people use C or no C? Good amount, okay, good, good. Uh, go into other reverse engineering tools. How many people use like IDA? Good amount. Uh, Binary Ninja? Good amount. Radari? Can the people who raised their hand for Radari please leave? <laughs> All right, um, so back to the talk. Uh, so, most of the time you see it for like malware, CTFs, there's VR, which is vulnerability research in this context, not um, virtual reality. And there are many other use cases. You might see like some private firm reverse engineering and other company stuff for uh, various reasons. But for the most part, malware reverse engineering, VR, and that type of thing, CTFs. Um, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about static analysis. So Deidre is not a dynamic tool. At its current release, it does not have anything to do dynamic analysis per se. So it doesn't have a debugger attached, although uh, from what I've heard, they are planning to release it, or at least from what I've heard from people on Twitter. Um, so yeah, reverse engineering, and the focus of this talk is going to be sta or static analysis. But generally, reverse engineering can be broken down into static and dynamic analysis. Dynamic being you're actually executing the binary, or maybe you're emulating it and you have some way to interact to see what the results are from various instructions and so on. Static being just looking right at the assembly or maybe a decompiled C light syntax. Uh, disassembling is usually taking bytecode and bringing it back up to the assembly. So when you execute a binary, be it an ELF, uh, an, X, um, an MZ or something like that, 
it generally has like a bunch of like ones and zeros and opcodes that your computer's going to interpret. Uh, so this is just bringing those uh, bytecode back to assembly. Or in the case of like Java apps, it's bringing like dex bytecode and bringing it back to like the Java syntax. And decom uh, yeah, going back to decompilation, it's assembly to an IL, which is an intermediate language. It's um, like a step before you get to a C light syntax. Or if you're using Binary Ninja, all of their uh, representations are some form of IL. So it's just a way of abstracting the assembly to try to make it more understandable and give it like some type of uh, flow control or flow analysis. So what is Deidre? So um, from the, um, I think it's Deidre SRE website, they uh, give you a way of how to say it. So it's Deidre. Uh, I know some people say Deidre. I honestly don't care what you say, but that is apparently their official way of saying it. Uh, so it's a software reverse engineering tool with uh, version management and decom uh, decompilers. The version management is interesting. So I'm assuming a bunch of people here have used Git, right? So you have a way of tracking binaries and either submitting them locally or submitting them up to a server in order to go back. So say that you are doing a reverse engineering task, right? And you want to document this binary. And let's say you're sharing this uh, reverse engineering task across like a team of like 20, 30 people. Uh, someone can commit the changes they've made back up to a server. And another piece, uh, person can like go into it and see uh, what types of things they've added in, they can merge it in, or they can deny it, and so on. So it actually adds some very like powerful features, and has been useful for like CTFs and also for like group reverse engineering at companies. Um, so they have a repo on GitHub where they have active like contributors, and you see people actually fixing bugs and um, so on. You also have people who I want to say are just looking for uh, bugs in Deja just to look for bugs in Deja. There have been some good CVEs that I've noticed, but I think the first one that somebody was trying to talk about was a bug. Um, I think uh, by default, when it was first released, it had a debug port that was open, where you could, uh, only when in debug mode, it had a debug port open, for which you could connect in and send, arbit like, uh, send stuff to execute. But I don't know how many people use debug mode. And then also the issue is that it uh, listened on 0.0.0, .0, .0 instead of the like local interface or something like that. Um, I don't know. The guy was really happy about his first blood on Deidre. I thought it was kind of lame. But some other people have found bugs where like in the parsing of the um, actual like blob that it gives you, uh, you can have uh, ways of manipulating their database to get code execution. So I thought those were pretty cool. Uh, and then also it is multi-platform, so it runs on Linux, OS X, Windows, et cetera. What's up? Yes. Public release, yes. I'll let them uh, talk about that. Personally, I have only used Deidre since the public release. <laughs> Somebody's trying to find the feds in the uh, room. Uh, also, can everybody in the back hear me okay? Sorry, I didn't really check. Sweet. Let me ask a question. I'm going to need you to repeat their question for the audience. Okay, so the question that was just asked was if anybody had used uh, Deidre prior to the public release, and I don't think anybody raised their hands. <laughs> All right, so going on to supported architectures, we see Rob Joyce, who is the person who um, I believe was fighting to get Deidre released, but also gave the talk at RSA that initially released Deidre to the public. But we see a lot of different architectures. Um, let me grab my water real quick. But yeah, so we see a, sh a ton of uh, architectures, uh, some of them that are very interesting that aren't available in other um, decompilers would be like MIPS, for instance. So Ida does not have a MIPS decompiler as of yet. Uh, so this is one thing that makes MIPS um, reversing a little bit easier. I recall from a time when we were at DEF CON CTF last year in 2018, everybody wanted to uh, shoot themselves because they were working with the MIPS binary, and nobody likes reading MIPS. 
Yeah, so they have a ton of different architectures, and also it's pretty extendable. The um, <laughs> the dis uh, decompilers are now open source, so I believe as of 9.02, uh, they are open source, so now you can go and see the C code that uh, does the decompilers. Um, just recently in May, they released a 9.04 that we'll talk about. Also, feel free to stop me if anybody has any questions or anything like that. Uh, so this is how you get access to Deidre. Uh, DeidreSRE.org gives you a download, and then you can also compile from source from the uh, Deidre repo on uh, GitHub. Uh, and notice that uh, if you try to do a quick GitHub search for, um, oh wait, is not the right one? <laughs> All right, there we go. Uh, if you try to do a quick search for backdoor in uh, the GitHub, you can't find any, so. But yeah, so you have at the current time of the screenshot, which was probably around April sometime maybe, you had 241 open issues, 28 pull requests, and a lot of people watching it, 15,550 stars and so on. So seems like it's garnered a lot of interest. And I mean, for uh, decompilers that are open source, there haven't really been any good ones so far. I mean, I qualify it as good as that. There haven't been anything, or hasn't been much that could compete with some of the other paid options. So. Ghidra has definitely added a lot of features that are very nice and also opened the world to more competition, as we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, so what's inside the box? So when you download Ghidra uh, off of Google SRE, you get a zip that you'll go through and unzip, and it has a bunch of different documents in there. Um, if you're running on Linux or OS X, you're going to use Ghidra Run. Otherwise, you have a Ghidra Run.bat for uh, Windows. And that just starts up the uh, Deidre interface, and we'll go through a little bit about that. But um, going into some of the other things, so we have docs. They actually have uh, a Deidre class going through advanced, intermediate, beginner steps of like PowerPoints for what they give internal training for people for Deidre. So those are actually really powerful. They're really interesting. I would recommend anybody who uh, wants to get into Deidre, like, string through those a little bit to uh, at least learn some quick uh, tidbits. Uh, they have some like HTML stuff for like a cheat sheet, uh, change log. Um, they also have all of their uh, um, Java docs. So they have all of the UI written in Java. So they have Java docs for all of that as well. So pretty much everything that you see when you're trying to like modify or edit Deidre for something is actually very well documented. So that's something that's really nice. Um, I already kind of talked about the Deidre trainings. There's also a tool that will convert your IDA databases. So let's say you've done a lot of work. Uh, maybe you're vendor locked into IDA, some would say, where you have these databases, you've spent months and months of research modifying this database and so on. Uh, why would I switch to Deidre? So they actually have a thing that works very well for converting your IDA database into a Deidre database. So. I thought that was pretty cool. All right, so getting started with Deidre. So once you run that uh, Deidre run, um, either bash script or x, uh, dot bat, uh, you're going to get a little pop-up that looks like this. And you have uh, to create an active project. Um, and we'll go through a little bit of that in the demo later. Uh, from there, you'll add like, different binaries that you want to add. Um, something cool that... Um, makes it really nice. So uh, those of you who have used IDA, are you familiar with flirt signatures? Anybody familiar with flirt signatures? OK. So flirt signatures are like um, signatures that you can apply to like different shared objects. So like if you have a libc that's not current on your machine or something like that, or you have a bunch of different other shared objects for like uh, libraries, for instance, that the binary had, and you want to include those ends. Usually you had to run across a flirt signature to get those to load into the binary to be able to see what functions are in that library that are also uh, used inside of your um, binary. Uh, DJ just allows you to import the shared object, and it will automatically try to uh, figure out which things are available in the shared objects that you have loaded, which is actually really useful, and I have really enjoyed.
Uh, but generally, when you try to open something, so as you can see, I was using my Mac for this. So we have a Mako format, uh, just an SSH sets binary. And uh, to load things in, you'll press I, but we'll go through that a little bit more. Uh, and then you can like go file import. Um, so yeah, now going into the automated analysis. So when you first open a binary, you're going to a screen that says some like weird stuff saying, do you want to run this analysis? And it's going to give you a bunch of stuff that is already checked and then give you an option to check something. So I have read through a lot of these and for your default, like, at city sets binaries, there's one of them that you want to go through and, uh, do the analysis afterwards. But then there are a lot of them that are read. Uh, some of them are either prototypes and may not work. Uh, other ones are like, uh, may take a long time. And so usually the ones that take a long time, I'm like, I'm willing to invest the time. So I just like them, but we can go through some of these options as well. And if you like just hover over any of these options, it actually gives you a nice description of what they do. All right. So, um, another thing. So it's not, I believe, immediately opened on a new session, but I could be wrong. Uh, maybe it changed in the newest version, but, uh, graph view is another option that you have inside of Deidre. Um, that is very nice. So, um, anybody who's used Deidre probably lives in the graph view for the most part, probably uses the, uh, decompiler for certain things, but generally it's trying to go through the flow control, figure out where things are going and living in the graph view. I've noticed that the workflow with Deidre is a little bit different. I don't spend as much time in graph view as I, might have an Ida, um, which has its pros and cons. And also server collaboration. So as I was mentioning before, you can set up a DJ server uh, in the download that you have for when you download DJ from DJ SRE. You get um, some stuff where you can run and maintain a server for DJ, which allows you to push up your DJ um, like databases to that server and allows you to collaborate with other people. Uh, for our CTF team, we have someone who has set up a DJ server and we use that to uh, analyze some of our binaries when we're trying to collaborate and work on a challenge. Note that that's not great for every CTF because sometimes you get a lot of binaries and the binary is a little bit easier, so you may not want to do this much collaboration, but like for things like DEF CON, DEF CON calls, we're spending a lot of time uh, reversing them. And also like um, Google CTF coming up and like generally for harder challenges where you need a lot of people and a lot of time, uh, it's actually pretty useful. Um, some useful features that we can talk about. So we have themes. Um, I've actually personally had a difficult time finding a theme that I like. Uh, there's a ghetto dark mode that you can use, which uh, I believe you go to like metallic and then you invert the colors and it gives you like a pseudo dark mode, but it also makes everything else kind of illegible, so still working on that. I know some people have um, published some like open source, like solarized dark uh, themes and stuff like that. But there's no like um, I'm forgetting the name of the repo, but there's a, like an Ida themes repo which gives you like tons of themes. That there isn't one for Ida or Deidre as of yet. Um, oh yeah, so we talked about a little bit about uh, Xrefs and. Um, like function call trees, uh, it's a little bit different. You don't just press, um, I believe, accent like in Ida, so I go to the HREFs. You have to like, I don't think there is a button to hit the HREFs. Usually they're just located on the uh, disassembly view, or you can like click a button in one of the uh, UI features. Um, we'll talk about navigating the symbol tree. So symbol tree is this box over here. Um, I probably use this a lot more with Deidre than I would with Ida navigating the uh, uh, graph view, but uh, this gives you like access to see like what things are imported, what things are exported, uh, different functions that you have, labels, classes, and namespaces. So I'll go into that a little bit when we do the demos. Um, and then mod E is just something to remind me to show you uh, one of the weird features that it has. Uh, so now for like useful plugins, there's Dragon Dance, which is kind of similar to Lighthouse for Deidre. And it's used to like visualize, manipulate, and like get a uh, grasp of like the areas that have been visited and so on. So um, <coughs> very useful for code coverage. Lighthouse is very useful, written by, um, I believe that one's written by Marcus. Um, I always forget how to say his last name. It's like Last Loden or something. Um, 
then you have a Deidre community gist, which I thought was pretty interesting. It lists a bunch of like plugins, uh, CPU extensions that people have written, uh, and so on. And then you have uh, Daenerys, which is um, so we talked about having like an IDB to Deidre database conversion. This converts your IDA scripts, which a lot of people have IDA Python scripts that they care about and also kind of interlock them into IDA. So now you can convert and run your Deidre scripts in IDA and run your IDA scripts in Deidre, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, now it's demo time. <coughs> One second, got to figure out how to get all of my OS head strings to go to the right place. Anybody have any questions in the meantime while I'm uh, getting this rolling? Um, so you can definitely learn, like, or load a kernel into, um, so like if you want to learn, load, like, the Linux kernel, or for instance, the uh, Windows kernel into Deidre, that definitely works, but you're not going to be able to do the debugging aspect. So, like, um, um, <laughs> though, I wouldn't say that you would necessarily use IDA for the debugging aspect of that as well. So IDA does have a debugger, uh, but this is my personal view where the IDA debugger is pretty awful. Um, so normally for like doing Windows debugging, for instance, that, especially if you're trying to debug the Windows kernel, uh, WinDebug's probably going to be the best bet. And there are like plugins to integrate IDA with WinDebug, and I believe there are new plugins now to um, integrate Deidre. So like the view that you have on the Deidre page, so like where you are in the uh, graph view or in the uh, decompile view or in the uh, disassembly, to the execution or order or to the instruction that's being executed in the binary. Um, does that answer your question? Sorry, that was a little bit of a mouthful, but okay. Let's see. Oh, this is going to be fun. One moment. All right, sweet. Actually, Okay, well, that works a little bit better. All right, so now we have Deidre open. Notice that we don't have an active project, so we'll create a new project here. Um, and now I have no idea what's going on, so we'll go back, run Deidre. All right, so now you're getting the option of a shared project or non-shared. Shared going to be if you have a Deidre server that is up and running. Um, I'm going to name a project, just name it like test with a bunch of random T's so I don't overwrite my other test. Sweet. So now we're going to upload a binary. So um, Views got a little scrunched up because of the new layout. So let me organize these real quick. All 
All right. So over here on my desktop, I have three different binaries with source that I want to go through. And then I have an APK that I wanted to look at, as well as a MIPS binary that um, we worked on for um, DEF CON CTF last year. Also, a recent meme that I wanted to show you. Um, so I believe I talked about it, but uh, Deidre has an undo feature. So when you, for instance, make a mistake in the uh, d um, like modifying something, uh, you can hit Control-Z or undo and uh, undo some of the things. Uh, note that this is not something that you're able to do with IDA, and you could um, horrendously mess up an IDA database just by uh, messing up something, and there was no undo. So a lot of people would have to like take snapshots of their databases constantly or if they messed up something, would have to go back to either from scratch or deal with it or something like that. So undo is a nice feature. But um, looks like Ida is going to be adding an undo in Ida 7.3. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Also, DJ throwing shade on Twitter, uh, <laughs> telling them that's a cool feature. All right, so let's see. We'll go through Hello World first. <clears throat> so going back to that um, interface I was telling you about, so we have, oh, get rid of these. Why do I have so many things open? Here we go. So yeah, so we have that uh, interface. We're just going to hit OK. There's really nothing in here that you'd want to do. Um, if you are trying to load... Uh, a binary that is the same name. So for instance, you wanted to, uh, you had like binaries that were different versions. So you had like a version 1.0, 1.1, 1.2 or something like that. And you had different versions of it and you wanted to diff them. Uh, for that, you would want to like rename the program name to like 1, 2 or something like that to uh, differentiate based on name. And then you could just diff them like as normal. One thing that I've noticed as well with, um, so for instance, say that you are um, trying to reverse engineer something that does have multiple versions, and that thing also has a ton of like shared objects. Um, you might have a bad time if the shared objects have differences, so you might want to create a new um, project for each different version uh, if you have different shared objects and stuff like that. So it's not like Ida where you can just have a database and apply third symbols uh, of the new thing. You have to create a new project, but just a little caveat. Um, so we see here that we're uh, loading a lot of information. Um, just gives you a bunch of general information about the binary. Uh, down here, if you had like shared objects that were found, then we could uh, just, uh, notice that over here, I don't have this uh, shared object here loaded into my uh, DJ instance, and so it's not able to find that reference. But that's okay for right now. So now we're going to double click on Hello World. Notice we get the uh, drag in, stuff like that. Now we're being asked to analyze the binary. So now we're going to go back to that one um, string that I showed you. You see how we have a bunch of different uh, options, like decompile the parameters, saying this is going to take forever. So run this afterwards. So generally, I would recommend running, running this afterwards. Uh, then we have a bunch of them that are like prototypes that I personally haven't really played with too much or haven't really run, so I'm going to just go with the default right now. Now what's happening is that it's uh, analyzing the binary. It's a very small binary, so it's done already. Notice that we only have one function, that is the entry, and this is just a simple hello world, so we see that we have the... pull this over the assembly, and I'm not sure if many people either read or go through Red City Sit Assembly a lot, but like, this is pretty common, pretty easy to understand, but if you aren't able to understand that, then we have a pretty simple uh, printf to hello world and then return zero. Note that we can do things like um, renaming this function, so this is actually my main function, for instance, so we can rename that. Um, it says that it's undefined, we can edit the um, like return variable to uh, be like, I don't know, an int or something like that. And that type of thing. Um, so there's lots of different things that we can do with that. Um, 
So now we'll close this. Load a new one. Now we go through recursion. So I'm assuming most people are familiar with what recursion is. You're calling the same bunch in multiple times and have different light statements for where things might go through. Um, so very similar, you get a very clear understanding of what's going on. Note that these are pretty simple binaries at first, and then we kind of like progressively go deeper. And again, it's analyzed pretty quickly. I know a lot of people were going to be afraid that uh, Kijra was going to be extremely slow because the interface is written in Java. And by all means, for the graph interface, so I'd also probably show you that. So um, function graph, uh, we're looking at an undefined symbol. So we'll go to our functions. We have our entry. And if we go back, we can see a little uh, function graph here. Um, personally, for my workflow with Kijra, uh, one monitor does not cut it. Um, you generally you need either a very large monitor or two monitors, preferably. And I generally have the graph view on one monitor and then my uh, disassembly decompiled output on another monitor. <coughs> um, I think just like a general um, difference in how people work at the uh, the place that this was developed. So. Maybe everybody there has multiple monitors, or maybe has a different workflow than like what people may have. But generally, two monitors is probably the minimum that I would recommend. Otherwise, you're gonna be doing like what I'm doing and having it like click back through. And then if you're running something like um, like if you're on Windows, for instance, you have to like click over, uh, find the window that you want, stuff like that, or things like that. So generally, two monitors is uh, what I would recommend. Um, Any questions yet on what I've done? I've kind of gone through things a little bit fast on what I'm doing, so any questions? Sweet. So right here again, we have a very simple um, example of like just recursion, and we can go through. I'm gonna put the mic down real quick. And you can see that we just have a main function and then a recursion function. And as we go over, so I touch the, pull these closer together. Uh, you can see this is our main function, kind of noted as uh, entry. Uh, for here, I didn't right click, I just hit L. If we uh, go back, um, if we right click, we can see that we can just uh, hit L to rename the function. So this is going to be our main function. Um, we have uh, like uvar1. We just like called this X, so we can uh, rename this to X. And it'll go through and rename the rest of them as well. Uh, we can go down into our recursion function. Uh, now what's going on here is a little bit more complex than we have going on over here. But this is just trying to uh, interpret this uh, square root over here, which while it looks very simple here when you're decompiling it, um, it has a lot of different steps. So I think this is something that you deal with a lot with uh, anything that happens math-wise when you're reverse engineering. Uh, while it may look simple when you code it, um, it's going to get decompiled to look pretty ugly. And you just kind of have to like figure it out. But you can see here that we're just calling it a square root function on uh, this. So we can see, yeah, OK, we're square rooting something. We have a sub going on. And then we also call recursion again. Now we're going to move on to a, um, a little, I guess I want to call it more complicated uh, example. So this is going to be an echo server. And we can pull up the uh, code for this as well. While that goes up, I'll go through this.
Um, so remember uh, last time I said, like, after you finished, you might want to go through and do the uh, data compiler parameter, or parameter ID um, as a one-shot kind of afterwards, uh, just because they mentioned that it may take a little bit of time. But since this binary is, again, so small, it goes by pretty much instantaneously. <coughs> All right, so... Now we're back over here, so um, move that to the side. You can see that we have um, over at the top here a bunch of different uh, variables that are like conduced down to stack variables. And then we also have xrefs over here. Uh, another good way to get xrefs is to hit the uh, uh, button here, this green downward button. And we can see like incoming references and outgoing calls. Uh, note that this one really doesn't have any um, other functions that are really calling it, so we're not really going to go anywhere. But for instance, let's say that we went to um, like memset and then try to look at incoming calls to that. We can see entry calls it, and we can see where it calls it here. So if you wanted to go down and see like the functions that are, um, like for instance, how I like to reverse is I go from, uh, this is the function that is being called, I know what this function does, but I not, may not know what this um, like subroutine is doing. So I go from like, I know what memset does, I know what um, malloc does and stuff like that. So kind of like go up from there. Uh, some people do it a little bit differently. You can also navigate from, Okay, I go from the entry point of the binary, and I want to navigate down to um, like the different calls that it goes through and stuff like that. So it really just depends on what you're looking for and what type of understanding you're trying to get to. Uh, generally, I go for like networking because I know if I can get a receive, uh, I know that's where my input's coming in, and I can try to look for something. Like if I'm looking for a CTF, where that input is going to see uh, what manipulation I may have of the binary. But yeah, going back to the top here, so we see our entry, and if we go over here, we see that we have our um, variables and then a bunch of stuff going on. So um, if you're not familiar with like uh, C um, sockets, um, it's kind of fairly simple. You set the uh, family to AFINet, so we're saying this is going to be um, IPv4. We're setting the uh, address is going to be integer any, and then we're doing um, H to network stack, so it's like um, our network um, symbol or something like that. I forget what the, NS, the S stands for. But we're basically converting this from a um, human readable to a network readable um, address. And then here we just like listening on port 7. But we can see some of the uh, same calls. So you see that I don't actually call memset. I call B0. But under the hood, uh, B0 is just calling memset to zero out the um, data inside of this uh, local stack variable that I have. So let's go through and like fix some of these things up. So let's see. We have our uh, character um, of 100. We can see that we have our string here. So just rename this to string, right? Hmm. OK, so that's interesting. In uh, 1.04, they were actually supposed to fix this, but it seems like they didn't. Um, so let's actually go through and manually um, fix this. So. If anybody noticed that this was a uh, character um, array of 100, and when I renamed it, it uh, mapped it to a character array of 108. So I actually ate one of the variables that were underneath it. So uh, we can just retape that to 100. It kind of fetches itself back up. But uh, some of the bugs that I found when like manipulating Nidra, um, 9.04's uh, release notes, let's see actually mention fixing this bug, but I guess they didn't fix all of it. So yeah, fix concurrent modification exception when replacing one data type with another that results in uh, some other data type being like renamed or removed. It seems like they didn't actually fix that for my use case. So I'll go 
re-update that bug ticket. But that's the one thing that's nice about Deidre is that the people that are maintaining it and actively working on it have a uh, GitHub where you can go through, you can notice bugs when you're working on something and uh, submit issues. And a lot of times, some of these things do get fixed. Yeah, so now we can go through and see some of the other stuff that we're doing. So we see that our bind has some different stuff that's being told. So we have three variables being passed to bind. If we go back and look over here, or if we just like uh, did a man of bind. Uh, actually, we're looking for like a man too. So binds used to name a socket, and we see that we have um, three things passed in a socket, a socket address, and then an address lin. And so when I go through and I'm reversing, say that I don't remember the parameters that are passed to a function, I can go man the uh, function, look up what's going on, and say, okay, so I know that this is going to be the socket that's being passed. So we'll just name this thing socket. And we know that this is going to be a um, like socketer address, which over here I'm just calling like sock server or something like that. Serve address. No, wait. Yeah, serve address. So we just call this uh, server address. And you see that we kind of like make it a little bit more readable. Because so now we can see that. Because we renamed this variable that was being passed to bind, we can also see that it renamed the variable passed to listen. We can kind of clean up the binary uh, as we go along. We can do this with global variables as well to try to make it a little bit more readable when you're going through and reverse engineering it. Um, oh yeah, I wanted to show you, uh, I guess, one of the interesting features. So if you do mod E or control E uh, <laughs> and just spam it, it does a lot of random things. It does the same thing when you uh, uh, spam click the thing. It's like, I just tried to show you like, hey, this is where the uh, thing you just opened is, or this is what the uh, last pane you clicked on is. <clears throat> I thought that was kind of a funny feature. Um, looking at some other people's like presentations and talks on Deidre, I know it's a lot of time that they show that you can click on it, but not a lot of people talk about like mod or control E as much. And then again, you can go through and you can reverse this a little bit more. Um, these have just been like plain and simple like at city six binaries though at city four. Uh, so let's go down. Let's do something cool. So let's open up our APK. So this is a APK. This is like an Android app. And we're going to open it as a file system. Note that we then get to see all of the contents of an APK. So if people that aren't familiar, you get like an Android manifest and you get some like various other information. The uh, DEX is a Java bytecode essentially. And so that's what we're going to be interested in. And for some reason, it doesn't like me. Let's see here. There we go. So one thing that's interesting, I guess, uh, I did this demo, um, like the prep work for this demo in 9.02. And in 9.02, I was able to double click this. Maybe I just didn't wait long enough for it to analyze it. Um, I didn't have to right click and then insert it. But at any rate, we have now our classes.dex. And we can go through and analyze this. Note that we're getting different options now for the uh, dex by code. Uh, and we get a ton of options that aren't checked. We'll just go through the basic ones for now. Uh, another thing of note is that um, while the C uh, binaries were fairly simple, um, took a very short time to uh, go through and analyze, the uh, DEX actually takes quite a while to analyze, even though this is just a simple hello world. We note that Java throws everything in the kitchen sink into the binaries, so it can be understandable. Any questions while this loads? Go for it. So the question is, if there is a size limitation, um, theoretically, yes. I mean, you're probably going to be limited by your RAM, uh, noting that 
this thing probably does take up quite a bit of uh, uh, RAM just to like analyze and do all of that loading. Um, but I haven't ran into many issues. And I've opened some pretty like large files and binaries and like uh, firmware. So um, maybe if you ran into something that was like gigabytes large as a binary, which would be insane. But that that might cause some issues. I haven't actually like ran into that. But, like things in the upper hundreds of megabytes have analyzed no problem. Any other questions? Actually, it does look like we're done loading. So. Similarly, we get like a view of the uh, Dex by code. So I personally don't know how to read Dex. Uh, I don't know how many of you do, but we can go through um, kind of look at some of the stuff that's been like incorporate it and stuff like that. But this is just trying to like show that you can open and analyze uh, like APKs as well. And then the last thing is going to show that you can open and analyze MIPS. There you go. So the one thing about the pointless binary is it also takes a little bit longer than the other ones. But this is an actual binary that was given to us from DEFCON CTF. So rather than being like a toy binary, it has a little bit more stuff going on. But as you can see, we can go through, we can analyze it. Um, and as soon as these uh, functions pop up, uh, it's actually pretty nice. We do get main. So there's a... Um, I guess for the binary isn't stripped. So stripping a binary is like removing symbols. So for instance, if I didn't want someone to be able to reverse engineer it, I could strip the bi uh, binary. But also stripping reduces the size of the binary. So a lot of binaries do get stripped just because of size. Uh, it removes a lot of like some of the debarred symbols, some of the um, like nice names that might be added and so on. But as you can see, this is a MIPS binary. This is pretty nice because Previously, and like other things, we would have had to go through and read through all of this um, MIPS assembly, but now we get like a little C light syntax that we can read to try to figure out what's going on. Uh, and that's it for my demo. I can go back through to my slides now. So let me get this set up so that it's no longer mirrored. Um, That way it looks a little bit nicer. Oh, there it is. Now we go back to present. If I can click. So now, any other questions about Deidre? Go for it. What do you mean? So, like, are you looking for like workflow? So, for instance, mm. so I will say that the original developers are uh, maintaining it. So, for instance, I don't believe they're going to add in every pull request that is uh, given to them. And, for instance, I know they haven't for some of them, but I think they are taking them into consideration and will add some of them. The issue is that they have their own baselines and stuff of users that they also need to support, so um, there's that. As far as like issues, though, I've seen a lot of fixes for the issues, and actually if you go back to um, the website, so let's pull this up. Where is my mouse? So you see how they have issue numbers? These are actually go back to the, um, one second. 
is actually go back to the uh, Ghidra page on uh, GitHub, and we'll show like this is the issue, these are the fixes, and this is the commit that fixed it. Um, so I'll say the community's been very active and like publishing issues. Uh, when it first came out, everybody was trying to look for any like sense of a backdoor, for instance, and stuff like that. Uh, people were looking for bugs in it just for the memes. So there was that little rush. But after that, it seems like there have been some really good um, fixes. So for instance, uh, when 9.0 came out, uh, using Ghidra on OSX was actually awful. Uh, if you tried to scroll, you would um, like flinged all over the binary and stuff like that. So they fixed a little bit of the DPI settings because, I mean, the people over there aren't going to be using touchpads to do the reverse engineering work and stuff like that. So there are some UI fixes for that that were fixed. Uh, any other questions? Go for it. Has become a tool that you use? I will answer that question in a little bit. Any other questions? Have you run into any of the problems with errors being thrown when you try uh, I've actually had, so, funny thing, my, I mean, going back to the workflow, when Ida fails to decompile something, I'll open Ghidra and decompile it, because usually it works. Um, I'll go into a little bit more of my opinions of the different tools in a bit. So they haven't come up with a actually crash the uh, I haven't seen it crash. Uh, Notice that when I was trying to open it at first, I just installed 9.04 this morning, and trying to open it like, and create a new project crashed it on my machine. Uh, so, I mean, there are definitely bugs in the new version. But um, overall, as far as the like decompilation, like I've never had it not be able to decompile something that Ida wasn't able to decompile. Go for it. Um, I mean, theoretically, yes, but, um, it really depends on what they're doing for the uh, deobfuscation, though. It's like a hard answer to answer. I don't really know. What, what happens when you open an obfuscated file? Say again, an obfuscated file? Yeah, well, when you open well, it depends on what type of obfuscation you're talking about. Is it like a binary which just loads something that is encrypted into memory and something like that? Yeah, yeah. Mm, I haven't run into those issues when working through malware with Ghidra, so I can't really say. Um, yeah. Okay. Go for it. Uh, I haven't been repeating the question, sorry. Do you know of any efforts uh, to report the decompilers to other versions of So the question is, do I know of any efforts to uh, Port the Ghidra disassembler or decompilers to other tools, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know of any. So, like, I uh, troll on the Binge Slack a lot. Not troll, but like, I lurk on the Binge Slack a lot. Um, and a lot of people have mentioned, like, would it be possible to integrate the Ghidra decompilers into Binja? Uh, and for their use case, no. Um, mostly because they're very different as far as P-code, P-code being the IL for um, Ghidra versus Binary Ninja's IL. There's just not as many, sim there's not similarities in the way that they have done things and lifting is different, and so there's not a one-to-one -one match. Um, otherwise, I know of some people who want to build a new UI for Ghidra because they hate that it's written in Java. And also, it looks kind of dated. So people have been wanting to build a new UI for it, but nothing as far as like porting it to other already available tools. Um, I know the person who made Diaphora, which is like a bin diff thing tool for um, Ida, is working on a uh, Ghidra uh, thing for that. Let's close this. Any other questions? You said you were going to based on yeah, can I do an off the record? Can you turn the uh, recording off? <laughs>